Nice to have you with us.
something they call Screak. Maybe that's something else. I don't know. He's stupid no matter what.
respect to get that emotion out. I went to a Black Lives Matter rally right after that to support, but I must have gone too late. It was all white women. <laughs> they got signs. Jay Campbell grew up in public housing on New York's Lower East Side. I was raised poor black child, but I was uh, a <laughs> state <Yeah. laughs> No, I um, I don't know. My childhood was well, I was the youngest of seven. Uh, my mother worked like three jobs. My parents were separated, not yet divorced. We were very poor. When did you realize you knew how to make people laugh? Maybe in school. When I was very curious, and then I would realize being curious was funny to people, like to grow ups, because the quiz of a child could really knock you on your heels, you know? And young Michael Che was indeed named after that other famous Che, the controversial revolutionary, Che Guevara. Fitting, you might say, for a sometimes controversial comedian. I like it for maybe a very toxic reason. I do think that. Controversy brings people to talking, and I think as long as people are talking, it's, it's not all that bad. We can't even agree on Black Lives Matter. That's a controversial statement. Black Lives Matter. One of his best known routines as a stand-up is about Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Exist, can we say that? And of course, it's occasional counterpart, all lives matter. Like, well, all lives matter. Really? Semantics? That would be like if your wife came up to you and was like, do you love me? And you were like, baby, I love everybody. What are you talking about?
first time. I think one of us should have a seat. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll take that on. Thank you. Even when playing composer George Gershwin's piano in Washington's Library of Congress, to Lionel Richie, performing comes natural. So cool to be in this building. They got all these writers up here Aristotle, Hugo, Richie. I like the words. Although, you must admit, that this is slightly overwhelming. <laughs> Richie is being awarded the library's Gershwin Prize for Lifetime Achievement. You're here not as a tourist, you're being inducted. I keep thinking of Tuskegee, Alabama. Mm -hmm. That's where it started. Born in Tuskegee in 1949, Richie has been a worldwide superstar for some 50 years. First is one of the Commodores, then as a solo artist. Now you put it right here from Good Luck Diamonds. Now as a judge on American Idol. Still, Lionel Brockman Richie Jr. says his worldview was formed on the campus of Tuskegee University with his parents, Lionel Sr., a U.S. Army Systems Analyst, and Alberta Foster, a teacher. When did you first realize how unusual your childhood was? Now, remember now, this is in the middle of the 50s, 60s, you know, right in the middle of the storm of civil rights. And with these kids growing up on a college campus with everything available to us, that's the Tuskegee Airmen over there. World War II heroes. World War II heroes. Just walking around. And what they didn't realize, they couldn't vote. He says the campus was his protective bubble. We just thought that was a normal thing. Doctors, lawyers, PhDs, all black. All black. And we didn't realize that was because of segregation. There was no place else for them to go where black people could thrive. Of course, Richie had his own idea of success. For you, growing up surrounded by black lawyers, black doctors, black war heroes, and you decided to form a front band. <laughs> this was disastrous. You have, to understand, you have to understand, to walk into my family home and say to my mom, dad, grandma, yeah, I joined this band, the Commodores were the Black Beatles, and my poor grandmother, mom and dad almost had a nervous breakdown. Um, and then from the community, you could see everyone passing going, oh, there's poor Lionel. Poor mis misguided <laughs> He didn't seem misguided for long. He and the Commodores quickly signed to Motown Records, and in 1971, they toured as the opening act for the Jackson Five, led by Michael Jackson. <laughs> Michael and I, he's about this tall, mm -hmm. and he said, oh my God, why now? We sold out Madison Square Gardens, and I said, no, no, you sold out Madison Square Gardens. You lost. Richie, who started as backup, became the Commodore's lead singer and songwriter. Three Times a Lady was the game changer, a number one song around the world. And it was the most unlikely song, because remember now, Funk was king, and I, of all things, write a waltz. <laughs> Runs, rides, and I'm thinking, oh my god. That's a song that changed not only the size of your fan base, but maybe also the complexion of your fan base. The massive crossover meant everybody wanted to see us. But, but people sometimes use that word crossover like it's a bad thing. How did you think about crossing over? I had a big problem. Because a problem with the term, with the term crossover. crossover. Because someone asked me a question one day, Lyle, how does it feel that you've left your roots? And I said, Did you ask that to the Beatles? Hmm. Did you ask that to the Rolling Stones? Everyone came over to borrow from up, I can't go that way. In 1982, Lionel Richie went solo. The next year, he released Can't Slow Down, which won the Grammy for Best Album. God bless you, and to my fans, I love you. Thank you. I looked up to see who the competition was that year. Bruce Springsteen, born in the USA, Prince, Purple Rain, Tina Turner, Private Dancer, and Cindy Lauper, she's so unusual. So I can leave that, I can leave right now. I just drop the mic. Got this feeling that was deep in the soul, and it just came in. 
hits included Stuck on Youth. Hello. And one of my favorite songs of all time. Well, my friends, the time has come. I've got Corral Fiesta. Come on and sing a ball. All night long. It's a multilingual song. Sort of. I called a friend of mine in Jamaica and I said, listen, when Bob Marley said, what is it? My body, my body. What does what, what he say? He said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> so I went back and I wrote, Tambali de Sendimoya. Yeah, jambo, jambo. We can bat they all we're going. Of course, it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> success, he took a break. My father said, I'm not feeling well. Would you come check this out? And nothing would have stopped me, mm -hmm. except that was a bad moment. Lionel Richie Sr. died in 1990 with his son by his side. It gave me an opportunity to kind of take a look over my shoulder just a little bit to see where I was in altitude. Mm -hmm. And it was frightening. His father's death, he says, changed his perspective. I became so nostalgic. I was famous, recognized around the world, but I missed all the Christmases and the New Year's. I with you inside my mind. These days, Lionel Richie works at his own pace. It's now been 13 years since your last album of all new songs. That's crazy, right? How much longer will your fans have to wait? The answer is, it will be this year, I promise. A new generation of fans sees him on American Idol and on social media, although he's less popular there than his influencer daughters, Nicole and Sophia. Do they give you advice about how to navigate this new kind of celebrity that exists now? Yes. <laughs> but did you take it? Yes, I do. Believe it or not, I did not. Former judge, uh, mentor, dad, right. grandpa, right. award recipient. Yeah. What's your favorite role? Just being Lionel Richie. Although I will tell you, of all of those, the one that has taught me the greatest lessons in the world is dad. But overall, the journey of Lionel Richie, if I may speak of myself as a third party, you know, the whole adventure is just a, an amazing ride.